Hey, this is John Buck. I'm back with another video in our exciting array signal processing series on shading, where shading is a way we can change the magnitude or the weight we apply to each sensor in the array to reduce the side lobes, although at the expense of having a larger null-to-null -null beam width. Uh, this is actually part three of this incredible series. Uh, so if you haven't already watched part one and part two, I'd suggest back it up and watch those first because we're going to build on that. And hopefully if you are uh, binge watching your way through this this groundbreaking series, you will enjoy the uh, conclusion as, as we bring uh, our discussion to a close here. So in our last episode, we had just gotten through talking about that when I design a, 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 a dream former to look in a certain direction, say U sub S as shown here, I end up with the, uh, the signal power I want in that look direction, but then I have another term showing up, which is the interfere power multiplied by the beam pattern, and that this all gets added together and now we want to take this in, to more concrete, um, this more concrete thing into the issues we talked about earlier conceptually, which is looking at how these issues play out for resolution, uh, where a sub s is approximately equal to a sub i, that they're roughly comparable, and that, that a sub i and u sub i are also close in angle, right? Where we have two sources that become close together, when can we see them separately? And, and the thing that controls that resolution basically comes down to the null to null beam width. How far apart are the two sources compared to the null to null beam width? Masking is a different case. Masking is when the source we're looking for is much quieter than the interferer, and these are further apart. And this has to do, this is, is more to do with the peak side lobes. So those two features of the beam pattern are what control these real world problems of when can I resolve two closely spaced sources as opposed to just see them get blurred together in a single peak. And, and then when can I find weak sources in the presence of strong ones, uh, or when are they hidden by the side lobes, right? So, so those are why we care about null to null beam width and peak side lobes, as they translate into real world things about our ability to resolve closely spaced sources and our ability to find weak sources in the presence of strong ones. Okay, so if I think about resolution, if I have two sources that are fairly far apart like this, when I design my, my beam pattern, and I steer it, if they're fairly far apart like this, and I apply the beam pattern on this one, we'd say, well, that's, in fact, I, the way I drew it, it actually hits in the null, but they're still far enough apart. They wouldn't overlap. And similarly, I would see when I, when I steered in this direction, I'd see the same width over here. And so if I went, sort of took the sum of all these things and looked at what my scan response looked like, it would look something like this. These, these low side lobes might add up, but I'd see two complete distinct peaks like this. And so we, when we see two peaks coming out of our resolution or out of our source, the, you know, this is the good case. We'd be looking at our span, scan response and say, yes, there are clearly two peaks there. And that will be the case as these things move closer together. But at a certain point, right, as, as these two get closer and closer together, these two peaks would overlap and become merged into a single peak. So, so looking at this example, if I, if I put the same sort of be, uh, beam width down on top of each one, right, so I now have this beam here. It's, it's about this, try to make it about the same width. And this one here, when they started to get close enough together, what I would see is I'd barely see two peaks, and at some point I wouldn't see two peaks at all. It would just, as they got closer and closer together, they would sort of, the sum of these two things would overlap and add up into one wide peak. Right, and so this is why we say that the resolution limit of a beam former depends on the null to null beam width. In fact, there's a special term you may have seen sometimes, the Rayleigh resolution limit, which dates back to Lord Rayleigh, the great physicist. Is, is essentially one half the null to null beam width. And so when it comes to resolution, if, say that the separation in U, which is, is the difference between UI and US, 
is greater than the null to null beam width, we can always resolve this, these two sources. When we, when we push that a little further, getting closer to the Rayleigh resolution limit, if delta u, which again, defined this way, is greater than a half, so at the Rayleigh resolution limit, we can usually resolve them, depending on, on the exact values. It, it depends a little bit on the relative phase of the two sources. We can get cases that are very hard and noisy situations to resolve, but we al almost always can. But if the reason this is called the Rayleigh resolution limit, if it's below that, we definitely cannot resolve the sources. We don't see them, so we don't cannot resolve the sources, which means we just see a single maybe slightly broader peak in the scanned response. So how does this connect with steering? Well, think of for a minute, if I'm looking at U or Psi or wave number K sub Z, pause the video for a moment and think about how does the null to null beam width change as I steer my ray vectors. I apply that multiplying by complex exponential in space to shift in angle, which is spatial frequency. How does that uh, change my null to null beam width? Right, so it turns out null to null beam width, one of the reasons we like working with U, Psi, or KZ is like we see in DSP, time domain DSP, the null to null beam width is independent of my steering angle. That if I'm shifting in frequency of these variables, the, the width of the main lobe doesn't change as I shift in frequency. On the other hand, the null to null beam width varies with steering angle if I'm working in theta. Right at broadside, the null to null beam width is proportional to 2 lambda over nd, but by the time I get to n fire, the null to null beam width is, is more like 2 times the square root of this quantity. Which is to say, if, if I think, well, n is the number of sensors and d is the spacing between them, this is proportional to the aperture. Right? This is basically the aperture. If you want to be picky about every last sensor, it's re aperture is really n minus 1d. But this nd shows up a lot in the sync functions for the beam pattern we've seen. right? So when I'm looking in theta broadside, my, my beam null to null beam width is 1 over the aperture. By the time I get to n fire, it's one over the square root of the aperture, so I need a lot more aperture to make a narrow beam towards end fire. Now, this pro this inverse proportionality to aperture is true for all the variables. What is different about theta, though, is that the the width shifts as I <clears throat> as I steer towards end fire, and it's not just a jump of these from one to the other. It goes smoothly from one to the other. So now let's let's that that's uh, how steering affects resolution. Let's talk about masking. Again, masking has to do with how much the loud interferer might overwhelm this, the, the weaker interferer by the time I think about the details of the beam pattern and its side lobes. So, well, uh, the un unfortunate case that I try to avoid, and because these are, require th are about things that are often very different in amplitude, we'll talk about them in dB. Even though they're kind of far apart, I might have a beam pattern that's slowly decaying like this, and I say, well, if I'm going to bring this down, if I look at, the, at how much energy will be coming out of the beam pattern steered in the U.S. direction, I'll get all of this coming through with a zero dB, and then I'll have this side lobe here will be subtracted in dB, right? Whatever power this was, I'll be it'll be attenuated by this many dB for this side lobe, but as I sketched here, if this is on a dB scale, the, uh, the red one, even when I knock it down a few squares, would still be taller 
than the blue one. And so this would be the case where I see masking, like, like we saw in the class problem last week. Right, so that's the unhappy case, that, that when I put this all together and looked at an overall scan response, I wouldn't really see this as a distinct peak. I'd see what I would see when I had this, the beam to make the scan response. When I steered in this direction, I'd see a nice big peak. And then the side lobes wouldn't show any real, any clear distinct peak showing above the other side lobes when I'm over here. Right, that as I had worked across scan coming down the side lobes, this tall thing would basically be tracing out the side lobes, overwhelming this. At the other extreme, though, now if, if I look at this and say, well, maybe I used one of these shading or tapering ideas, and the, my, oh, my window got a little wider, but I was also able to really bring the side lobes down a lot. Right, That would say that by the time I got over here, I would have attenuated this one so much that its output power was less than this, right? This, the number of dB down, the side lobes I'm subtracting. If I look versus the peak here, down to here, this would be how many, how many dB down the side lobe was. I subtract this from the red peak, and it would be smaller than the blue one. So in this case, I would see the second peak. Right, and that would be a good thing. And so maybe if I put this in green on the same thing above, what I would see here is all these would get get wider. So in this case, if I went up here, this would be wider. But because this had come down enough, I'd see a clear peak. I'm not drawing it very, it should be wider here too. But I would see this peak sticking up above the side lobe. So it would sort of go down and then come up and then continue on its way going back down again. So I would see with enough attenuation this would sort of push its way up through the side lobes, this weaker signal, and I would see that clearly. Okay, so, in, oh, oh, and one other important thing, with this whole assumption that I'm going to have 0 dB here in the look direction, there, that comes from an important constraint I should have mentioned. So let me quickly put this on the end. To guarantee... that the beam pattern in the look direction equals 1 or, in, or 0 dB on the log scale. We need to rescale the weight vector so that when I take the sum across the weight vector of all the weights, For, this is for the broadside version that I get one, right? This is true for our standard earlier beamformer, right? Our classic CBF at broadside. If I have n, n elements, they're all weighted by one by n, and when I add them up, I get one. When I add the shading or tapering to it, that may change. MATLAB doesn't scale the tapers that way. So I sort of put a little warning sign here, sort of my dangerous road sign, right? like a road sign saying caution, tricky, tricky thing here. MATLAB does not do this. So when you do, when you use the, the functions in MATLAB, like handing or hamming to, to create a, an array shading, after you've made that array shading, you need to, or, or use that shading, you need to make sure that you rescale that shading to have a sum of one to give you the gain of one in the look direction. All right, so with that nugget, I'll stop our our three-part series here on array shading, and uh, see you in class on Monday.